Ryan Stanton here with ASAP Frontline, joined by Dr. Don Stater, a friend of mine that I've actually worked with for a number of, well, a couple of years now, related to more of the opioid with his active role with the Colorado um, opioid recommendations, guidelines that we've hijacked and stolen much of the information with no intention whatsoever of reinventing the wheel or doing anything else unique on our own, but just plugging in your work uh, into our work environment. Uh, but today, you've got a new, um, an important project. And uh, as most people know, probably many people do not, um, 2018 is the 50th anniversary of the American College of Emergency Physicians and really an early pioneer when it came, came to the profession of emergency medicine. And really, the amount of evolution that's happened, the change that's happened, you know, the difference between then and now is, is rather remarkable. And um, something we'll talk about is how in the world you got involved with it from this standpoint. But you guys are working on a book, and you are the editor in chief of this book. And I'll let you tell folks about it and the purpose, and um, something very different than what I've talked to you before about. But you know, it's it's something that's going to be a huge thing, and one of the premier projects for this year with the 50th anniversary of ASEP. So. Dr. Stater, uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, tell us about this this project. Yeah, well, thank you, Ryan, again for for having me on your show. A bit long time listener, really enjoy <laughs> it. So, uh, so you're doing great work, and I just want to applaud you and, and encourage you to continue to do the work you're doing. So, uh, my name is Don Stater. For those who who have not had the pleasure of meeting yet before, uh, I'm an emergency physician practicing in Denver, Colorado, uh, and I was. I became involved in this effort by ASAP to create basically a piece to celebrate emergency medicine and the college for its 50th anniversary. Um, I think why I became involved, Ryan, was because of my work previously uh, as a history buff mm -hmm. with uh, Emra's piece, which was 24-7, uh, 365, The Evolution of Emergency Direct, uh, Medicine, a, uh, a movie which I served as the executive director and did a lot of the creative work for. So I think when it came to ASAP celebrating 50 years, a lot of people looked around and said, hey, this guy knows the history and he seems to be a glutton for free work, so let's ask him to do something for us. Well, and what's nice is interviewing you is you have a great personality and easy to talk to as opposed to some other directors, producers of other things, maybe not related to this and uh, that I've talked to in the past. So it's good to have a conversation about this. So talk to us about the idea behind the book. You know the name and how it's how it's evolving and how you decided to set this up as, as a project. Sure, let's talk first about the idea behind the book. And we knew for ASEP's 50th, first of all we had to do something really special. 50 is a huge anniversary for the college and it really does mark uh, an age of maturity for us as a specialty. Mm -hmm. um, when we looked at the landscape of different things we could do, we talked about doing a movie, we talked about doing a lot of different projects but one thing that always resonated is kind of the need to be introspective uh, for our 50th anniversary. And speaking with different creative people, nothing really creates introspection the way that a book does. Mm -hmm. You know, because the quiet, quiet environment that you're reading it in. We also came up with this concept that we should have stories because ultimately what we do is just a tapestry of stories. And our stories as emergency docs are some of the best out there, bar none. So what we decided on was a book that kind of put together 50 stories to celebrate the 50 years of emergency medicine. And each story should be different, almost just like you're walking into a different room in the emergency department. So even when you look at the DNA of the book itself, it's predicated on what we do in emergency medicine. It's created for emergency doctors, by emergency doctors. And the question of why, why we're doing it is because we really have to celebrate the amazing things that our colleagues, that you do, that all of us do in the emergency department to care for our, our patients and our communities. And that was really the ideal of the book. We didn't want a piece that was rah-rah, too ASAP heavy. We really wanted a piece that was about the common ER doc, the common paramedic, the common nurse. And we always try to keep those frontline providers at the forefront of our minds when we are creating the book. And you mentioned just then, uh, this isn't just physician-based stories. You're, you really get the web of emergency medicine, one of the more unique places in the hospital setting where everybody, no matter your degree on the wall, really works together in terms of pulling this patient care spectrum together. So it's not just physician stories. Yeah. I mean, emergency medicine, as is often said, is the ultimate team sport. 
We can't survive without our nurses. We can't survive without the paramedics in the field who bring us patients. Uh, we can't survive without our techs who are running around putting IVs in. And what we tried to do is we tried to get different voices to really give that full spectrum of emergency care. And not only kind of different providers, but also different age providers. So when you look at the book, we have some of the real forefathers and foremothers of emergency medicine. People like Bruce Janiak and Peter Rosen and, and Judith Tintinelli. But then we also have residents, people who are just starting out, and people all the way between those two different frames of their career. And what we think that we get throughout that is we create a mosaic which is really true to what the emergency department is at its 50th anniversary. I really like how the preface, you know, you're talking about um, the shooting at the theater in Aurora, Colorado, and it really kind of summarizes emergency medicine where everything else tends to be very well controlled, well regulated environment. Um, the response of when that shooting took place and the call to the trauma center that was having its challenge of its own. You know, kind of get into that just a little bit. To, that For story. sure. And so we, we agonized so, so long, months, literally, around coffee tables, around beers, over, over everything about what the heck we're going to call this book. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and actually the name come, came just from writing, reading and writing the stories. And uh, one of the stories that always resonated with us was the story of those providers who cared for patients during the Aurora movie theater shooting. It was tremendous tragedy in our country's history. And there's a line that just jumped at us, which is, bring them all. And the context of this is, you know, one, this madman goes into a theater, he opens fire on a 400-person packed full movie theater, injuring 70 people. It's absolute chaos. There's a call that goes out to the closest trauma center, which is the Aurora, uh, Aurora Medical Center, which is in Aurora, Aurora, Colorado. And at that time, that medical center is already chock full to the gills of patients. They've already got a full board. They've got a waiting room. And to kick that all, to kind of make that all much more dramatic is they've got half the department closed for renovations, including all their trauma bays. So the emergency doctors start hearing their charge nurse, Jen, uh, speak to the EMS uh, dispatchers, and they say, oh, there's, there's a lot of injured people. There's, there's all these, how many are you going to bring? There's no question. And, and there's all this chaos. And at the end, she just throws her hands up and just says, bring them all. We can take it. And to tell you the truth, that's the personality, and that's the thought process behind what defines us as a specialty. We're unscheduled. We have this can-do attitude. We can take whatever society, medicine, et cetera, throws at us, and we're going to be there for the patients on the front line, willing to do whatever it takes to care for our, our patients and our communities. So Bring Them All really became the rallying point to the book. And we thought it was also a colloquial but, but good way to show people what we do as a specialty. And they realize that, you know, it's we don't have the perfect environment. We don't have the perfect setting. It's never, we tend to, what I find more than any other specialty flex to the need as opposed to flex to the, um, you know, the capabilities. You know, make it happen. Make it work. You know, being creative in the emergency department, you don't have all the tools, but what can I make that's going to make this work? And, you know, that situation where, you know, tragedies happen, they seem frequently on the news, uh, if you watch it, you know, there's always something going on. But for any particular emergency department, you know, maybe once in a lifetime that you're going to have a huge influx or situation like that. So it's not like there's significant experience there. There's not like it's, you practice, you know, that you've, this is the eighth time this has happened, so you've gotten really good at it. You don't practice up. It's really just about the personality of emergency medicine in general to, you know, do what it takes, um, mm -hmm. take it on the chin for a little bit for the patients. You know, it's, it's, it's one of the careers in medicine where I feel like you know, we sacrifice ourselves and our nurses and techs do and everybody does sacrifices a little bit on certain occasions for the patients and for the needs based on you know their presentations and the situation that's out there um, and whereas other places are pushing people to the ER because they can't handle a change in volume or a purge or you know something closed down um, we're like bring them all we'll deal with it We'll figure it out. We're going to stabilize. We're going to assess everybody. We're going to stabilize everybody. Then we're going to figure out after that what we're going to do afterwards. But once it's once that's calmed down and slowed down, then, then we'll have time to do it. But for this point right now, just send it. We'll figure it out. 
and we'll roll from there. Yep, exactly. And like you mentioned, it's in the DNA, and we're going to make it work. And just to refer back to that, to that night that's the inspiration for the book title, as they cared for 22 patients, 23 patients, a lot of whom were really critically injured. None of them died. You know, they rallied, the hospital rallied around caring for those patients. People came in from all across the hospital to provide aid. People came in from home, like Gilbert Pineda, who's one of our featured stories, heard about this and he just jumped in his car and came in from home at one o'clock in the morning knowing that there was going to be need, that there was going to be people who needed to be seen and cared for by our emergency doc. And, uh, and really, I think that's one of the really defining things of the specialty, something that we're all so proud of and something which we wanted to highlight in the book. Within the last 50 years, we've gone, emergency medicine has gone from, you know, a, a theory of having a place to park patients who aren't inpatient or an outpatient that specialists and family docs can some see their patients to see what's going on after hours to really the primary source and location of uh, acute care medicine, where we evaluate, where we uh, diagnose, where we stabilize, and then disposition as its own um, unique specialty. I mean, I still get it all the time, you know, the patients come in and saying, so what are you going to do when you grow up? What are you going to, what are you going to do for your career? I was like, this is my career. This is, this is what I'm trained in. I will not flourish anywhere else in this hospital. You don't want me doing your heart transplants. You don't want me trying to keep up with your kid's vaccination schedule. This is what I do is quick assessment, stabilization, hopefully diagnosis and then disposition where you need to go. I mean, you can go wherever you want, you just can't stay here <laughs> and getting them somewhere else in the hospital. Give us some ideas of, of some of these stories, some of the things we can look forward to within the book. Yeah, so the stories, really, I think all of them are just so beautifully written. Uh, they're, they're distilled, first of all, from the interviews of different emergency providers uh, who we chose to go and have Eugene Richards, who's a world-famous um, photojournalist. Um, most people in emergency medicine will probably recognize him from the Knife and Gun Club, which he, which he photographed and produced back in the 1980s before HIPAA. And uh, he agreed to come back, you know, almost, almost 20, 20, almost 30, sorry, 30 years later and be the primary photographer and interviewer for this book, which was a huge get for ASAP and a huge get for the specialty. So we flew Eugene all the way across the country, from Atlanta to Alaska, from LA to New York, and places in between, uh, to get this really wonderful geographic diversity in what me emergency medicine looks like in different environments in different places. We went to small, we went to large county level one tra trauma centers. We went to the boonies and kind of followed around docs who work in these real, really critical access hospitals. And um, again, we tried to capture the full spectrum of emergency medicine. Uh, these stories are all kind of made for ER docs. So none of them is over two pages. Why? Because Perfect. we're damn ADD, ADD adrenaline junkies. We can't sit there for you know an hour and read The Count of Monte Cristo and War and Peace. I mean, a lot of us just aren't wired that way. So they're quick hitting. We know emergency doctors like pictures. Who doesn't like pretty pictures? And some of the pictures that are in this book are really going to be pictures that define the specialty. These are going to be pictures that people look back, I think, for years and say, wow, that really captures what we do so beautifully. And that's what's so powerful about this as a, as a, as a 50th piece, is we look back and these pictures are going to forever preserve some of the most famous emergency physicians, Bruce Janiak, Judith Tintinelli, Peter Rosen. And then they're going to introduce um, introduce us to other newer faces that we're not familiar with but are pushing the boundaries of emergency medicine and also of science. People like Johnny Kim, who probably isn't a household name, but he's a NASA scientist, was a former Navy SEAL. And you hear from really remarkable people about their introspective ideas of what it means to be an emergency clinician, emergency paramedic, you know, what the specialty has meant to them. And I think that all of these pieces, be they short, are truly meditative. I mean, they inspire a lot of thought, a lot of pride, a lot of questions about, about what we do. And uh, I'm just tremendously proud of the work that was done by our editors, by Eugene. And I'm so excited to kind of bring this to our membership and to really the public and emergency medicine as a whole. Um, because I think it helps us look at what we do with new pride and new insights into how special it is uh, that we created this specialty over the last 50 years.
it will be neat to, to see these stories and actually how the evolution over time. I mean, one of my um, one of my fellow Lexington uh, co-workers and former AMA president Steve Stack is going to be uh, featured as well. I think having the short, hard hitting is key. There's a reason. Um, I love National Geographic, but I've never read a National Geographic. Um, I've read the first paragraph of a lot of stories, and I've looked at a lot of really nice, cool pictures. Uh, but, you know, the ADD really kicks in, and I'm glad that most of our articles that we have have the, um, have the abstract, the story, and then really a summary of the abstract that is beside it, so you can read, you know, within two or three sentences and get them, get the, uh, get them more, uh, get the moral of the story. Give us a peek into, you know, some of the stories that we're going to see, some of the things in terms of the evolution uh, over, of emergency medicine over the last 50 years. Oh, there's so many to choose from, Ryan. Uh, really, all the stories are spectacular in their own sense, you know, and every voice has something to contribute to uh, our understanding of the specialty. Um, some of my highlights are kind of insights into people who we all know and love as emergency doctors, um, but we don't know their personalities, and their personalities really show through in this book. Um, for example, the fact that Judith Tintinelli raises chickens is the fact that I don't think many people know, but kind of came out during one of our interviews. The fact that Bruce Janiak, besides being our first resident, has adopted upwards of 50 foster kids. I mean, this guy is kind of a hero inside and outside of the hospital. And kind of his devotion to just going home even after shifts and caring for people who just need care. Uh, you hear from Steve Stack, who, as AMA president, cut his face wide open during a conference in Seattle and had to wait in a waiting room for three and a half hours while he was AMA president. Uh, and that's remarkable. And then you hear about people who work in practice environments that you've always been curious about. What would it be like to work in the far reaches of Alaska uh, as an air paramedic and have to fly people after bears attacks and after, after these tremendous outdoor injuries hundreds of thousands of miles, you know, to, sorry, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds of miles uh, in really remote, austere conditions to get medical care. Mm -hmm. um, every place is really this wonderful insight into what that, that provider's world is and what their worldview is. And it's just really interesting, all the different um, pearls that you get from people in their different perspectives and the new views of history that you get from people that you thought you knew. Give us some details on, um, you know, we're, we're at the For Your Eyes Only stage right now, so I'm gagged to secrecy, but of course by the time I release this, we will no longer uh, have our little secrets. Uh, when, when, when will we see this hitting, and uh, how will folks have access to it? Yeah, so first of all, we're going to release a few stories and a preface so that people can kind of preview what this book is going to be about. Mm -hmm. Uh, they'll be able to see some of the photos to know what it looks like stylistically, but they'll also be able to read some of these stories to know kind of what they're getting. Um, that's going to be coming out very, very soon. Just this last, uh, the beginning of this month, uh, and this the month of, of May, we actually sent all our stories into our publisher. So all the stories are finalized. They're just going to have some fine tuning along the way um, in order to, to come out with their final form. So we're, I'd say, 80% done with the book. Um, the last pieces are just kind of deciding the order of the stories, deciding what additional photos we want to include. Um, but I think that by the time your podcast comes out, we can work with you and commit to having a few stories online and available so that your listeners can see them. That's the key, of course, is we'll, we're recording here at Leadership and Advocacy Conference in uh, the middle of May, getting the latter half of May um, 2018 here. That's some of the background ambiance you're hearing with our PBS type uh, approach or NPR type approach to podcasting where you get a little bit of things in the background like folks chit-chatting and talking and a little bit of music here and there, but hopefully the music's not loud enough that we're going to get a letter from some publisher about it uh, or some copyright infringement. But um, you know, it's something that's going to be an important part. We're actually putting together several podcasts um, with uh, regard to um, the anniversary. In fact, I think we've got uh, probably five or so that are lined up to talk about some of the history of emergency medicine. You know, and the challenge, the important thing is, you know, at this point, 50 years in is documenting where things have gone because we've lost so many 
of the early pioneers. Um, you know, we've still got our first official resident from uh, Cincinnati, but we don't, you know, we, we don't have a lot of that initial stuff that really got it going. And so I think it's very important for us to document as much as we can to see where we've been and where we're going. Because so many people that practice now don't know anything other than modern emergency medicine and don't realize how much it's evolved. Growing up in a family of medicine with my dad being a surgeon, a vascular surgeon, you know, just talking with him about the evolution when he would moonlight about the difference of these clinics and, you know, that the emergency medicine didn't exist and, you know, the nurse or whoever would just have the patient sit there and they'd call the specialist in or the surgeon in or whoever it is to see their own patient, that there wasn't somebody else there to uh, necessarily see them or, or, to, or to manage them. And, you know, my dad finished medical school in 69, so it, he's... Mm. You know, getting 74 this will be 74 this year, but you know that evolution of emergency medicine, you know, just during that time frame, and, and I think it's important. So I think this is a great project featuring stories from physicians, uh, nurses, paramedics. You know, we got a full wide range of different angles and different approaches to uh, that history of emergency medicine. And how can uh, with uh, Dr. Don Stater? From California, I was about to say California, Colorado, um, from Denver, uh, also doing some great work elsewhere, but also stepping out here and getting one of the premier pieces for the 50th anniversary of ASAP. How can folks get in touch with you if they have any questions, uh, thoughts, or? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, the book is uh, available for pre sale right now. Uh, we're having a special pre sale rate of $68, uh, and you could buy it on the ASAP bookstore. Uh, by the time we get to the 50th anniversary, which w the book will debut in ASAP uh, 2018, uh, ASAP 18 in San Diego, uh, California, by the time that we roll out onto then, we'll actually be increasing our pricing to around $99 a book. Um, so it helps to buy now. Um, the way that people can get in touch, well, learn more about the book is one through the website. Uh, there's a website just on ASAP that you can click on and learn more about the book and we're going to be populating that in the coming months with stories and videos and other advertisements. Uh, we'll also be trying to distribute more, more information on the book uh, through other ASAP avenues, for example, ASAP Now, your work obviously, etc. So we hope that the whole House of Emergency Medicine really knows about this book and is, and is willing and able to, to celebrate it when it comes out. Um, how people can get in touch with me is really simple. It's my name at Gmail, donald.stater at gmail.com. Please feel free to reach out to me uh, if you have any questions about the book. Uh, I would love, love hearing from people, and uh, I'm really excited. On behalf of the entire task force of people, um, you know, which is dozens of people who have worked on this book, um, to bring this to um, ASAP and to bring this to uh, our community of emergency physicians as a whole. And you guys are doing some podcasting as well out there in Colorado? Yeah, we're still doing podcasting and, uh, and social events, uh, you know, with our, with our uh, podcast, The Emergency Medical Minute. Uh, it's short, sweet, uh, usually two to three minute podcasts that are done live in our emergency department, just like you're doing, a kind of PBS feel to it. You hear beepers and stuff in the background. Uh, and it's kind of nice because it's current. We produce around two every day. Uh, I'd like to say that we're Emergency Medicine's most prolific podcast. We're, we're around a year old, and we have around uh, four, 400 podcasts at this point. Um, and we also do social events where we get emergency clinicians, the public, together in breweries. And then we do what's called the Brewcast, where we drink beer and nerd out together. So those are fun. We're going to have to have you for one of them, Ryan. I would love to come out there for a little Brewcast, and then maybe you guys can do a road show. We can bring you to... Kentucky and we can do the bourbon trail and see the evolution of medical education between Lexington and Louisville once we get um, from distillery number one to distillery number 10 uh, and see what happens after that. I mean, it, it'd be, it could be, it could be, it could be epic. It could be disastrous. It could be anything in between. <laughs> and so I've kept up with uh, Emergency Medical Minute. It is great topical information. Basically, it's geared towards um, you doing, uh, or you or one of the other attendings doing a conversation based on typically a case that you guys have seen or something that you reference their education within. And it is great little, uh, basically hard hitting fast facts on, um, on emergency medicine topics. They do turn over pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, it's one that you can listen to a little bit here and there every single day. And, and uh, so great work from that standpoint. I've also uh, followed up with, I think I was 
followed the brewcast um, where you guys were talking about the uh, opioid guidelines mm -hmm. um, and I mean, did several talks from there and ended up watching a lot of those and you know that's great information that's the key for emergency medicine now it's this evolution of emergency medicine uh, is that how we've owned um, really bought into and owned this evolution of education and you know, I talked with Rob Rogers on his Medutopia podcast a couple of weeks ago about about this evolution and how you how you address it how you temper it and you know it's we just helped um, ophthalmology about two years about a year and a half two years ago start their first ever podcast mm -hmm. And that was after I was established on podcast, and I was late to the game on the emergency medicine podcast. And so, you know, it's there's so much great information out there, and you know that's going to be, and that's really what's reflected in your book is this rapid evolution, um, creativity, um, and you know now that's being ref reflected now with you know the podcast that we have here and you've got there, and um, and and more able to educate the public and, and our patients and um, our other colleagues, whether emergency medicine, physicians, PAs, nurse practitioners, and even others in the house of medicine. I mean, there's so much that's relevant within emergency medicine that plays um, throughout. I mean, you're commenting on a, a friend who's having something going on right now and educating from emergency medicine on what a fever means, what you need to do with a fever, does it, is important. That's, I mean, it's all incredible how we, how this specialty has become such a core of medicine when it really didn't even exist um, much yeah. more than a half century ago. And one of the things we talk about was really how we've gone from the missing piece, which is what the ASAP logo is, to the centerpiece of the medical system. Mm -hmm. And that really has been an evolution that has has occurred over the last 50 years, uh, from, a, from a disrespected uh, specialty to really one that now has an established place that everyone looks to as a keystone to our medical system. And uh, we have a lot to be proud of. Um, also, you know, I don't want people to think that this is just a history book, because it's not. What I like to describe it as instead is it's kind of a time capsule of what medicine looks like in 2018. Uh, like we said, we have some of our original founders, uh, those who are still alive, in the book. We have some of the newest emergency doctors. We have a lot of mid-career people. Uh, so it really is this wonderful time capsule of what the emergency care looks like right now. And all the photos were taken in 2017. So we're going to know what emergency looked like in 2017, in 2018 when this book comes out. Fantastic. As for me, uh, you've got donaldstater at uh, gmail.com. Uh, for me, you can email me, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. That's youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. Make sure that you're tuned in and subscribe to the podcast so you're getting all of these updates and unique episodes and things for our 50th anniversary and then uh, follow along at everyday med on twitter some comments here and there especially when we're at uh, conferences try to get some information out there and uh, until next time i'm dr ryan stanton and this has been some asap frontline